Yeah, hello and welcome to uh, this month's uh, Fredlock talk. Uh, this time it's a little bit of a different topic called about OBS or Open Broadcast Studio. Um, my name is uh, Peter Larsen and I, I talk a lot about technology, but I don't really talk about OBS. Now, I, I do want to mention that my setup today is a little bit different and most times I'm recording because I had a conundrum. OBS is what I use to do presentations with, <laughs> to broadcast myself. But now that we have a meeting here and I want to show how that works, how would I have to do that? So I've set it up on two different computers. They're right beside me, both of them. And then hence what you're seeing right now is from a different computer than I, what I'm on. So if you're going to look at my video, you will probably see me sort of go on in the ed, on the edge side and all of a sudden not being focused on the video. And that's simply because I'm moving between the machines to either be in front of uh, the presentation that we're seeing here or being in front of OBS and showing you what's going on. That said, it should work the same. Uh, and I, I, I will repeat what I started out by saying uh, before the recording. This is being broadcast from a 4K monitor, very wide monitor. And I'm doing that because I'm sharing the full desktop. And that's kind of gonna be important once we get into OBS itself. Because of that, I highly recommend you just basically zoom it, sorry, not zoom in, you maximize your uh, blue jeans window or the video when you do the playback that will make reading the details a lot easier. So this is what we're gonna be talking about today. Um, very short, uh, a quick introduction to what the heck is going on, what are we doing here, and all that stuff. And then I, I want to make the case of why I feel OBS makes a huge difference to what I do. Um, we're going to do a little bit of focus on streaming media, because uh, for, for a lot of people, that is the primary use case for using OBS. It is called Broadcast Studio for a reason. Uh, but it can be used without that technically in mind and for instance I use it for online meetings too so that, that's really not streaming media in the sense of hey I'm on YouTube or whatever else uh, I'm doing a live show there the focus of today is going to be going to OBS and showing uh, all the main features uh, with some demos with some walkthroughs um, hopefully some question and answers <laughs> um, and then I will show very briefly because this is a complete topic by itself, but I will show how we basically will set up a live broadcast to YouTube from OBS. And you will find that YouTube is just one of a billion options to broadcast to. So yeah, it, it, it's not going to show you how everything works. And of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about other tools that I use to make all of this work. And the screen dump you're seeing there is from my own system. And, and, as showing you what I've been using for one of my lock meetings, uh, not this one, um, just to showcase some funny stuff. And we will we'll go through some of this stuff uh, in, in live and see how it's been done. Oops, wrong machine. I knew I was going to do that. So anyway, yeah, my name is Peter Larson. I'm actor Red Hatter, but OBS has nothing to do with Red Hat other than it's part of Fedora. And so much stuff is part of Fedora that is really not a product under Red Hat. I don't talk about OBS as part of my work. It's just something I do as a hobby, and it's part of what I do to make life more interesting in these days. Um, I do a lot of electronic stuff, and uh, the reason I really wanted to do live broadcasting was I, I set up something to actually show some of that electronics, and being able to broadcast that was kind of important. Um, I do want to warn you guys, uh, I am colorblind. A lot of the stuff in OBS, because it deals with video, uh, it has a lot to do with color and balancing and filtering and masks and so on. And I, um, my universe of colors is very different than ours. So I may be saying weird stuff about coloring, but uh, in particular when it comes to palettes and so, but um, don't hold that against me. You can you can read. The, the materials, and you probably make more sense out of it by just reading how, what it does than I do, because I just don't see the world like that. Um, I am not a graphics designer, meaning setting up a scene, making the, quite, the right balancing and all that, it's not something I'm good at, but I can tell you when it's bad, and I think most people can. So it, it's one of the hard parts of 
for me for OBS is to set up something that is easily viewable and, and is not too busy or too boring. Anyway, so. So how do I do this today? Uh, right now, the main part I've been using it for, um, for real is being doing online meetings. I've done a couple of broadcasts a couple of years ago, a uh, live broadcast to YouTube from log meetings, and that works perfectly fine. Um, but I haven't done those, in, particularly since we did all the lockdown stuff. But I, I need to get back to that and get that going. Um, so what OBS basically allows you to do is do live video editing. That's basically the way I would say it. It allows you to set up sources of a stream and whether you want to record that into a file and then later send it out or you want to send it out live to everyone, it's up to you. Um, when you do online meetings today, since we've all done them for more than a year now, we've done nothing but, uh, they get a little boring. As you can see here, or it behind me is my office or uh, the back, back of my office with a couple of books and all that. And, and I've seen more and more people wanting to have these virtual environments instead of make life a little more interesting. I mean, I have a Star Trek background and uh, all kinds of other funny stuff that you can actually do. And with OBS, you can even make them live. So it's it can be quite fun to, to spice up the world of online meetings that way. And it's actually not that hard to do. Um, One of the things that to me was very uh, interesting when I first saw OBS was I thought first it was very low quality stuff. But it has turned out that one of my challenges with OBS is that because the video streams by default are kind of high quality, you need to have the bandwidth to support it. And the high quality of the, when you start share, uh, saving your videos also will run your disk space out very, very quick if you're not careful. It is not only a simple program to use, but it produces high quality results. And, and I, I cannot stress that enough. If you do not have the capacity on your machine, you're gonna run out of capacity very, very, very quick. So you need to have a buffer. And I stole my old thunder here. Um, I don't, the boxes that I run this on are 16 cores at the very least. Uh, they have plenty of memory and, and they now have plenty of disk space that didn't used to be the case. Uh, if you need to basically do video editing, uh, let's say you're recording an hour meeting um, and you're doing that on high quality, using 50 to 100 gigs on that alone, particular while editing is not uncommon of disk space. Your memory and CPU, every time you render, it's going to eat a lot of things. So if you do not have a GPU in your machine, you will probably not be able to do high quality video. It takes a lot of power for that to do. So one of the things I need to do on Fedora is I run CUDA on top of, uh, I mean, I have an NVIDIA card. So I enable CUDA that allows the rendering to take place much, much faster. Mm. I can do it without it. I've done it on laptops, but the quality needs to be set to match the laptop's energy. And I can tell you, I have a laptop that's, that makes a lot of noise when it gets busy because the fan goes in full speed. Um, and that will happen. So if you have a microphone in your laptop and you start doing this, uh, it will sound very funny. <laughs> um, but again, be sure that you set your settings depending on your hardware and that will take testing every piece of hardware will be different so do some testing see what works and what doesn't uh particular figure out what if you're doing a live broadcast does this quality video show up you know smooth or does it chop and if it chops it can be lots of reasons it can be that you don't have enough bandwidth or it can be that your machine is just not pushing it out fast enough uh, because it's too high quality. So you can, by lowering the quality, you own, you lower the bandwidth requirements and you lower the uh, amount the, the system needs to work at the same time. So you can find this balance with some experimentation of where you need to be. Um, and again, for most online broadcasts, you don't need to be in 4K. It, that seems to be what everyone these days say, oh, I did it in 4K and it worked. And 
That simply just means they have a beefy setup. And I don't know how many people, uh, basically when you upload to YouTube, very few places will save it in 4K because it's a huge file. It takes forever to upload anyway, but it can be done. Um, yes. You probably also will need to understand how to use a video editing tool if you want to do anything of a permanent archive of videos. Um, OBS does allow you to set up trailers and all that stuff, but a live broadcast like any demo that we do live tend to have issues that you may not want to put in the permanent recording, that you may need to edit out here and there. And that could be anything from noise We've all heard these stories about you can hearing people going to the bathroom in the middle of the online meeting. So things like that, you may need to, after the fact, want to edit out. And so hence, having a video editing tool around uh, to, for post effects is probably a good idea. It's not required because an online broadcast is a live broadcast, right? So whatever happens, happens. But you may want to consider doing that. So as I said, I use a GPU. I use CUDA with my um, my NVIDIA card. They are absolutely not required. Um, but I, since I do graphics to stuff, or uh, I do 3D modeling for my 3D printing and stuff like that, I tend to actually need a little bit more oomph uh, now and then. So I've set it up to work, and it act it helps a lot. If you don't have at least four cores, old laptops and old desktop with you know one or two cores, don't even don't go there. It just won't work. I think eight cores is where I started out with OBS. My my former setup had eight cores and that worked. Not great, but it worked. I could broadcast a good an online meeting in a readable and understandable format. Um, and as I just mentioned, the moment you have a slow CPU, and I mean slow in relative terms here, or a slow GPU, you just basically lower your resolution, lower the end result, and it can keep up. But of course, everyone now don't get that very bright, you know, SVGA, no, sorry, very, very high resolution image out of it. So, getting started with OBS is darn simple. OBS Studio, uh, basically just install that and everything it needs comes in right away. Now there is some modules and uh, add-ons that does exist that doesn't come in with your special hardware. Uh, I have not needed that ever, um, with one exception, and uh, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but that without really needing anything else, I can make an, a broadcast just after doing, directly after the OBS Studio install. Now, it will come up blank. I mean, nothing is configured. So the very, very first time you do this, it's gonna take you a while to set everything up. And that's something we will talk a little bit about when we do the demo here. But just keep that in mind that it doesn't understand how you wanna use it when you start up. So it, there is nothing there out of the box. Um, there is an app image for it. I have not used that. Um, I use app images for certain things, but I'm not a big fan of the format. So, but app images does allow you to run it on, let's say, unsupported uh, distributions that may not have been built to by the, uh, the developers themselves. Uh, so, if you are finding yourself on a distribution that may not be where it's not available, that might be a, an easy way around getting it going if you don't want to try one of the mainstream ones. I know Ubuntu has it. I do not know if they call it OBS Studio or something else, but you should be able to do an app get and install it right away from there too. It, it, it is not that hard to set up. So I mentioned some of these already, but basically OBS allows you to set up a audio and video source to, to send somewhere. That somewhere can be anything from a file to somewhere as a, as a live camera feed or as a broadcast on whatever system that supports broadcasting. And there are lots of those. Um, the screencast, what I've realized is that uh, because everyone is getting bored of these meetings that uh, like Zoom and all kinds of other stuff, they're now starting to figure out that people are interested in actually buying so they can have cool backgrounds and stuff like that. They will actually pay money for it. 
And for, actually, if you go and search on, for OBS uh, green screen backgrounds, there's a huge market out there too for where you can pay lots of money to get a professional designed green screen background that looks, you know, very, you know it is professionally done. Um, so you can actually get things done for you if you go out and look on the marketplace. But I do find myself going, why would I pay for something that is just basically me and GIMP uh, for 10 minutes and I, I have it done? And that me and GIMP may not be the best of friends, but I do know how to crop an image and to do a little bit of color balancing. So, And we will actually look at some of that today too. Um, a lot of things that I see OBS being used for is, you know, make our channels on YouTube or gamer channels that do live streaming of how they're gaming it and all that. It is very, very simple to set up. And one of the things that I'm extremely ecstatic about, so I just upgraded to Fedora 34 about uh, four, more, four weeks ago uh, on the preview, and it's not been fun, but one of the things that actually came out of that was OBS now has a feature in on Linux that hasn't been there forever, but has been on both Mac and Windows which allows me to define a browser source instead of a video source. That allows you to do live, cool live stuff that basically interacts without you having to do anything. Uh, so for instance, if you have a YouTube channel, one of the things that are very popular is it will show a live count of the number of subscribers you have, a live count of the number of viewers you have. If you have a live chat, it will show that too. And all of that is possible through a browser plugin. And that's now available. Uh, I must admit that when I saw that, I went, holy crap, perfect timing, because I can use that for this talk. So I'm doing that. Um, yeah, the last one I, I wrote there is, because it's online and it's live, you can do f full interaction, right? So you can make it more than just, hey, I have one scene, and all I have is this face moving around, and nothing else happens. So if you've been in a, let's say, a mega forum or a mega channel, you may have seen these channels where down in the corner there's a little round circle with a head in it, and then the rest of the image is whatever they're talking about. So you can still see the person talking, but they're not taking up the whole scene. Um, and that's one thing that OBS makes very, very easy to do, uh, and I will show you how I do that. Um, but it can do so many more things. So because it's live and I can put a little bit of animation and stuff like that in it, it can be done looking like it's a lot of work to actually make your broadcast. There's a lot of things going on, but there really isn't. Streaming media is a lot of different forms. Um, the cool thing is that OBS probably support, if you know about it, OBS supports it. And that's also the bad thing because it makes OBS look a little more complex than it should. Um, I will show how to do the video for Linux uh, loopback setup that allows you to basically tell OBS to broadcast to a live camera. You can actually see that already. So if you look down in the camera feed that is active beside my face, that's actually that loopback that is showing uh, an OBS screen being broadcast out. Um, it's showing the the slideshow behind this, but it, uh, in a moment it will show some other stuff. Um, I use the mainly for YouTube, but Twitch, o Odyssey, all of these other areas out there that allows you to do a live stream is is there, and then some. I'll show you the full list, and I, I, I dare you to find us something that you, you know that is not listed there. It is low. Uh, live streaming seems to be a new factor of life for a lot of people. Um, we all live in a world where we don't go anywhere. Oh, God. Yeah. I'm still hoping, I'm expecting the day for that to end. Um, making it a little more fun, yeah, it's fun. Um, and there's a lot of things out there you can get for free, or you can spend a little bit of money on to get an, a, a, someone who exactly knows how to do color balance and correct and stuff like that. That looks great when you in install it. The actual uh, setup of a stream and all the options you have for that is a very big topic, and I will not—they—I won't really have time to go into all the details. 
uh, once I go into the YouTube's area, we set this up. You're going to see way too many options to, to make fun. That said, the basics of it is extremely simple. All you need to know is an, you need to have a key for your stream, and you generate that on the platform you want to stream to. And sometimes you need to tell what endpoint to use, depending on what stream you have, and that's it. So basically an address of where to send the stream and a key generated that gives you access to actually send the data. That's it. Now, there's usually a ton more stuff that you want to indicate, like uh, that the platform may require you to do, like giving it a title, uh, you know, is it uh, meant for general, what audience is it meant for, and all kinds of other stuff. Um, also about formatting and how when to render it and, and when how to render it and all that stuff can be stuff that you need to take into account early on. And particular, some platforms, if you don't stream in a certain format, they might either reject you or take forever to render it. So you, you sort of have a choice. You do, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Um, but again, my focus here is really just to show you how the steps are for in, 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 in one situation, but not necessarily go to all the options that you have. So, the next many, many slides, I'm going to go through OBS's uh, kind of like uh, terminologies. And once I've talked a little bit about what they are and what they do, we will go straight into a demo. So this is a, a general overview. And, and I kept finding more stuff, and I didn't add them. To <laughs> um, but to me, these are the highlights, right? So OBS, we, we talk a lot about scenes and objects, and those you're going to hear about again uh, in a moment. There's an audio mixer. There's a transition manager. Uh, there's a set of controls that allows you to um, basically, you know, it's basically where all your settings are. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you have a studio mode that allows you to do um, easy transition and actually do live edits so you can see what the consequences are before the users see it. Of course, there's a streaming setup, there's a recording setup. Uh, you, once you enable it, there's a virtual camera setup or enablement. And then we have something that is relatively new to OBS called uh, broadcast profiles or just profiles. Uh, and then finally, we have a ton of filters. Uh, filters are probably going to be the areas I'm going to give the least justice to, because that's where we actually need to know about colors. But I can do some, because I use it all the time. I just use all the basic stuff, not all the advanced stuff. So let's start with scenes. So a scene is a core component that you, you can't really get started without having a scene first. So a scene is a collection of sources, and where those sources go in the scene. And a source, I'll get to a moment, is basically the component. It could be an image, it can be a video, or it could be something else uh, that you want in that scene. And because you have more than one scene, you, trans uh, you do a, tr a transition between scenes, like any kind of movie that you have, right? When the camera cuts from one scene to another, that's a transition. And you, once you set up your scenes, you can do that. So you may have one scene where you have your live feed, your, your like, I have right now my big head in it, but the next scene I may show a browser window and my little head goes down in the corner and that stuff. So, or I may have a scene that's, that in, you know welcomes everyone to the, the live broadcast and it just cycles there. And then when I want to start, I transition to where all the, the the fun stuff is. And when I'm done, I have another scene that thanks everyone for showing up and maybe have some cool links and, and all things like that that people can follow up with. How many scenes is up to you? You can have any number of them, and they are saved. Or you can import them, export them. So there, it, there's a lot of things going on that that a scene can help you with. But in the end, a scene depends on objects that is very system specific. So once you've set up a scene that you like, and you can export it on your system and import it again later with the same hardware, works great. But giving it to someone else might not be a good idea. Um, once the scenes are configured, basically that's your your job done. You're ready to broadcast because now going from one scene to another is a button push, or just waiting for a timeout. You can set up a timer and it will automatically transition between the scenes. Setting objects. So this is where OBS gets 
I think this is where it scares most people initially. So that's an object is what inside of OBS. This is what it can show you what it can do. So in order for you to get a video on there, you have to create a video source. And in this case, it's called a VLC video source. Uh, but you can you will probably notice there's more than one way of capturing devices. So knowing which one to use and how to use them is typically a little bit of a challenge. But you have audio sources, you have a simple color source, you can do a slideshow where you have like 10 images that cycles automatically. Um, you can even put a scene inside of a scene, kind of fun. Um, you can uh, do a real video playback, like if you had a recording from somewhere or all kinds of things. And then you can make groups of them. And the reason one of your groups is that once you have defined an object, you basically, it's kind of like object-oriented programming. You give it your own, you instantiate your object with your own name. Once that name is defined, it is now available to all your scenes without you having to reconfigure it. So as long as you get that instance of the object, everything is the same. So you don't have to reconfigure it. The only thing that is different is per scene is where in the scene does it go? And in some cases, how big do you want to make the bounding box? Um, but that's it. So once you have to find your object, you can do that. But if you have more than one that needs to go together, you make a group of them. And now you can share that group instead, and it all comes pre-configured. Um, yeah, so as I said, objects are placed inside of scenes, and again, it can be shared. So I will go for it. So audio mixer. This is probably where I have the most problems, because I have a hard time figuring out to how to hear what comes out of OBS. I typically have to ask everyone else in the audience. But it basically is the same for audio as it is for video. Everything has a source of something, right? So you can have an audio source from a real live microphone, but you can also have a source from a video feed. Your camera may have a microphone in it, or you may have a source from something else, or if you're sharing your desktop, your desktop has a microphone. So now that becomes a video feed. So you have to decide, just like you do with your video, how do you mix uh, from these different sources which microphone should come in at what gain, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the output sounds good. And as I said, to me, it's one of the hard things to adjust because listening to your own audio output while you're talking is not easy. <laughs> you basically, but the only way it works for me is I, I record what I'm doing in a video and play it back, and then I can hear whether it's too much or too little. Uh, it's pretty much the only way I found that works without anyone else around me that can listen in a different room. Um, that said, other, other than that side of it, it's it's fairly basic setup. It, you know, if, if you're an audio file, it doesn't have a ton of features, but there are filters for audio just as there are for video. So you can make noise filters. You can do all kinds of weird stuff uh, with your uh, with your audio, just like you can do with your video. Sorry about that. It's the house phone here. It will stop in a moment. Okay. Speaking of filters. So I did just two very quick screenshots, and I suck at it, as you can see. My, my border is not correct around it, but anyway, I was running out of time. So these are the main filters that exist out of the box. Again, I haven't done anything adding weird stuff to it. So as you can see, on the audio side, we can do compression, gain, noise gates, all kinds of funny stuff there. Uh, on the video side, um, there's a whole set of color correction stuff that really goes beyond my capability to explain how they work, because others. But the most important part that I always use is Chroma, because that's the way you do green screen. And I will show you, I'll pull down my green screen when we get there. Um, but you can set up masks and all kinds of other funny stuff around your video feeds, and I use that all the time. But not only that, but you can make it blurry or more sharp or change the light effects or pretty much anything you can think of. And there are plugins that add even more builders if you need to. Transitions. Um, again, this is how we go from one scene to one another scene, and we can define those pretty much anything we want. And this is something I didn't know once in the other day, so I love learning new stuff. So I've always used fade, uh, basically just like fades one out and the other one in at the same time. It's kind of like very traditional fill, uh, uh, transition. 
uh, you can do, I knew we can do swipes and slides and stuff like that, but what I did not know is that last one called Luma. So you saw Luma on the filter, and it basically just uses colors to decide what to do. So if you set up a grayscale, it will go from dark to white. And uh, so you can make all kinds of uh, effects of how it transitions from one uh, image or one scene to another by just making a single image and deciding where all the transitions are from black from white, uh, from black to, to white. Basically, all your gray tones determine how it follows around. So you can not only make your own, it comes with a bunch out of the box. And then you can go out and buy even more if you, if you don't know how to do basic uh, design in GIMP uh, to do that. It's pretty darn cool. It makes it very flexible. Um, so once you've set them up, and in every one of these, when it says add, it allows you to make a custom selection of a subcategory. That makes them very flexible. And hence, you can pretty much get any effect you want. So from control, uh, this is uh, sort of like on the uh, most right side of the screen when you, we get in. This is where we do all the main decisions from settings to streaming to recording and enabling uh, studio mode and all that stuff. Um, it's sort of like the main control board of everything you want to do, but it won't work until you have basic configurations of your scenes and your objects done. Studio mode, this is the way it looks, uh, and you actually have to enable it. It will not show up by default. At least I haven't found the option that does that by default. But as you can see, it allows me to see a pre and post um, broadcast. So the one on the right, in this case, is what's being sent out, and the one on the left is what I'm preparing. And while I'm preparing, I can add and subtract content. I can move things around. I can do whatever I want to do before I hit the transition key and put it out in public. So I, can, I get a chance to actually see what it will look like and make corrections before it comes out. So that's about it for me talking about it. Let me actually go over to the other box and I will now start showing how it works. Okay, so this is OBS, and because I have it in full screen, it looks less busy than it normally does, because typically it will look something like this, and it looks a little more compressed when you do like that, And but it's the same thing. Um, having it this big just allows you to make a bigger, wider image, but I just wanted to just be what we focus on today. So let's start with the scenes. So as you can see down here, I have already a lot of scenes to find. Uh, so trust me, this is actually a small list because I spend this morning deleting quite a bit. <laughs> but if I switched around, just notice how, how it transitions from one scene to another automatically, right? So if I click here, so it actually uses that Luma uh, I have over here, this transition, which is one of my custom ones. But if I go back to fade and I switch between my scenes, it, it changes the way it moves between scenes. So how do I set up a scene? Well, in this case here, uh, I have something called Command Deck, and I have a lot of things on here. Um, but let me do my Star Trek thing, Magic, and go, oh, wow, uh, that's nice, but I don't want to see the rest of my normal background. And the way I do that is by going into green screen. So give me a second. And I'll pull down the screen here. And you should now see that you can't see my background anymore. And I can move these things around. Now, I've made a little mistake here. Oh, let me just move to the side here. I've done some more things than I wanted to. Now, I can make it look like I'm actually sitting in a chair. Uh, I have zoomed it in probably too much to make it look realistic, but I think it, it should be darn obvious that I can make this look like I'm easily sitting in a chair talking to everyone. Um, so doing that, and I guess I need to move this up a little bit. There we go. Anyway, so 
notice over here that I have a ton of sources. And I, in this case here, I have my Star Trek background enabled, but I don't have to have that. I can say, I want to able enable this one. Now, one thing that shocked me, and I'm still not fully used to, every, I mean, you know this from a graphical system, there are layers, right? One thing, if you have more than one thing, one thing is technically on top of the other. And you might think that the top up here is the top, uh, is, um, the bottom layer, and then you start adding things on top of it as you go down, but it's the opposite. This is literally the top layer, and this is the bottom layer. So because I now added a layer on top of this layer, it overlap the other one. So I can delete, I can remove it, and you won't see it because I have an overlap. So if I go into the background I had before with my Tux background, it looks like that. Uh, or this is one of the things you can use for meetings. And Typically, if I zoom out my camera a little bit, this looks a lot better. But it just looks like, hey, I'm coming from a professional place and, you know, looks like anything. Or you can make some fun stuff out of it, like with the, the different backgrounds. And yes, I have a green screen backup. So how did I do that? How hard was setting up a green screen? So this is my camera source I'm highlighting here. It's called Video Capture Device. It's kind of a, to me, self-explanatory. And there are several things, and now because I have this in a huge screen, it, it doesn't look right above it. But over here, there are two options. There's the properties and the filters. And they go with whatever I have highlighted in source. Now, this is also properties. So these two are the same one, same icon. Properties, let's start here. This is where I define what, what is my device. Right? I have this camera, and some camera inputs have more, sorry, some cameras have more than one input. What format does it come out of it? And typically, it guesses pretty well what format to use. But you can pick other ways to how coloring and all that stuff. And this typically just depends on your camera. You you can set this resolution you want the camera to do. Now, typically, my screen, my my little face is down in the corner. I don't need high resolution, so I have that on pretty low setting. And I can do color range. And you might think that this is that's it, right? We have brightness and, and saturation, but no, there's a little scroll bar here, and you will notice that this is just one of many places where the number of options exceed your need. <laughs> um, but you can really adjust how the image is captured. Uh, in this case here, I have my zoom very far in. Let me zoom out a little bit. Now it looks like, oh, it looks like I'm sitting on the floor, but it, it it gives me more room. The reason I'm zoom in is because my screen screen is too far behind me. Um, my my office setup does not allow me to have it right next right behind me. So if I zoom out too far, let me show what happens. you actually see the edge of the green screen. So I zoom in a little bit, and normally I just want to zoom into this level here. And when I do, I can you know, make this as big as I want to and just move it around. Now notice, I don't know how well this comes true on blue jeans. It looks like I can see it on my own screen up here, that it kind of looks a little bit off here on the side. And that's because of the filtering being applied. And I'll go into that in a moment. So let me make it a little smaller again and go in here. So again, so that was the properties. That's telling it where to get the camera from. To make it green screen, we have to apply a filter. So we click on the filter bottom, button, sorry. <laughs> and notice that we have, uh, there's a set of audio and uh, video filters up here. And if I go in here, this is what the list you saw earlier. And most of this stuff has to do with um, audio, but there are a couple of other things. So this allows you to basically take out, let's say, a color or take out a particular effect. And this might also be, as you can see, noise uh, suppression. Could be what we want. Oh. Weird. Um, I'll have to figure that one out later. I think that's because I don't have an audio size, source. Down in my effect filters, I have, if I go under the add, you see I have the chroma key here, and that's the one I use a lot. So if you go under, look here at my chroma that I've set up, I basically tell it I have a green screen. I can change that. If I said blue, I don't have anything blue, so everything goes away. Um, 
And then you start having all of these settings. You see, as I start moving around, I have to adjust it. Because if I adjust it too little, it shows too much of the green. But just too much, I disappear. So it, it's a balance, and this balance depends on your light setup. And that's one thing I need to work on in my quote unquote home studio. So it's very important that you have the right light setting. Uh, I do have some, you can probably see, I have things like this that can help me uh, ah, smooth out some of the green stuff so it doesn't look like some edges. And it, it, it's stuff I'm still experimenting with to make it look better. And that's stuff that I can't really say I'm an expert in by any means. I don't really know what works yet. But yeah, light setting, from what I can see from others, that tends to be where they end up spending a lot of their money. It's not really on the video equipment. It's the, uh, how they light, how uh, the background stuff is done, so it looks as most professional as possible. So you can do smoothness, um, this. You can deal with the color, which is, it looks like it goes black and white to me. I don't know what else it does. You can add an opacity, whether you want to disappear or not. So it may not be a picture of you as a camera, but it could be something else. And you can literally sit in here and control how you want it to appear. Oops, that wasn't what I want to do. The next field I have is the sight crop. So this is one of those things that you think, wow, holy crap, this sounds advanced. So if you've done anything in GIMP, yeah, or any kind of graphical manipulation program. You know what a mask is. So typically we use a mask to say we have two images, but I only want this part of one image to filter through on the other one. I don't want the whole image. And while you can try to crop it, it's not necessarily always a square or perfect circle. Uh, it may be something else. It may even have graduate uh, overlap. It may not be it's all on, all off, you may have a transition in there. So we use a mask to do that. And typically we use a black and white mask. So you can see I have a file here that it refers to. Let me just uh, see if I can find it. I'm going to open up the Gimpy. Squat. Right squat. There it is. Oh, okay. But that's how that picture actually looks. Um, it doesn't take long to design these, even in in things like GIMP. Um, but it it you can take pretty much any drawing program you have, as long as it can create a um a PNG. I think PNG is the best format for this. All it look all this thing does is look at the colors and determine wherever there's black, it cuts it off. Wherever there's white, it keeps it. And then you can have it in between. And notice that this actually allows you to pick whatever color you want. So it doesn't have to be black and white. Uh, the problem I have is when it's not black and white, transition, when you start mixing colors, that doesn't work for me. So I use black and white. Um, so it's very simple in this case here for me to add these bars that doesn't show the side, but if I click it off, because my screen is not wide enough, now I can see the sides. So that's a very simple way of manipulating that image that I'm showing. And you don't have to make, and that's what I'm going to get to in a moment, it doesn't just have to be a square. So let me see if I can go into... Let's do this one. And so in this picture here, you can see it's a much simpler scene. I have a text for Fred Luck. I have the video source of me. Make it a little smaller. And I have the background image of the stars, which is just a, Fred, a um, fedora background. 
But what I want to do is I want to take this and I want to actually make a correct crop on it. So let me disable this one. mean circle and as I remember if I can find it I, and if I can't then I will go in and just make a new one but I should have a Okay. There it is. Okay. So I have a small mask here called in a circle, so I should be able to find that. And on to M. There we go. So I have a mask that looks like this, right? Again, all black goes away, only the white is kept. So when I apply that, my little head stays, uh, gets to be in a circle. And when I click there, I can now put my little head down in the corner. And I can even, if I wanted to, I can crop it so it doesn't have this white thing. But I, literally, I can just put myself down here and keep the action up here. So I could, might want to say, let me add a background for a... Um, a screen capture, right? So let's go in here. And now I can pick my... That's not what I wanted to do. Go away. I should have been it. Oh, there we go. So this is my video share. So I have how's that set up, you may ask. Well, it's fairly simple. Here again, the properties. So everything sort of works the way you want to look at each object. You just go under the edit and pick it. And so you pick the window that you want to share. And you can even crop it, do all kinds of bunk funky stuff. And once you have the source, it's in here. You can move it whatever you want. But the cool thing is that because you're doing it this way too, there's also filters here. So we could apply similar filters like we did before to change the way it looks. And that could be even a green screen uh, effect or filled out colors or do some uh, live effects. But see, now I could do a demo with my browser open that everyone can see. And, or my application in this case, and I'm, and I'm still in the screen for recording, but I'm not taking up a lot of space. And I'm in control of what it looks like. I can have all kinds of other things going on at the same time. And that to me is the reason OBS exists. This just makes broadcasting so much easier. Here's the audio mixer. Uh, right now, uh, well, I'm not putting out any sound here, so it doesn't matter. But, but I can go in, and if I have an audio source where it's going, it will show up. But let me actually add one. So notice when I go in here and I say create, or I hit the add, that it will show me the existing objects. Or these are the instances that it already knows. So instead of me recreating all the settings, what I'm doing is just picking an existing setting that I already have ready, and all I need to do is plug it in here. And, oh, sorry, I muted my microphone. That's why nothing is showing up. But typically, you will see it's showing up uh, with the, um, you know, it shows you the audio, how high it is, and all that. And you can actually do a couple of things in here, too and audio filters, all that stuff is available on how you want this to work. 
irritating. It never rings in the morning, and today it rings. Um, okay, so can't really show the audio right now, and I didn't even think of that, that I have to do that before I did this. Um, setting up a new scene, very easy. You just hit plus and give it a name. It's that simple. Um, you, these arrows you see here, just moves them up and down. Uh, up and down for scenes only allow, you know, allows you to easily move from one to another very quickly and, and, and have them sort of organized in a way you want, but really have no effect anywhere else in the system. Uh, in here, on the objects or sources, it really matters because the bottom here is um, the thing that is in the background and this is what's in the front. So moving things around tells you what, how things are overlapping. We looked at the scene transitions. I haven't gone through the controls yet. I'm gonna wait with that for a moment. And finally, let me look up here. So we have a, oh, let me go to settings first. So this may be another area if you ever opened up OBS uh, for the first time, and you go, I don't know where to begin, and you go into settings, and you see 500 uh, different options. This can be a little bit intimidating. I haven't touched most of these, and usually the ones I touch, I only touch when I need to, when I, I, I encounter something, find out that there's actually a setting that will fix that, and I go in and find it. So we have a setup general that helps, how does the actual application work? How does it respond? Um, and in general, how does it actually work? Um, sometimes if you have a slow machine or you have issues by when I did a laptop, you may want to disable some features to make it work faster and, and all that stuff. There is a layout. Um, don't necessarily, again, I'm using the standard setup, but there is other options in here. I'm not gonna mess with that right now. Then there's a stream setup. We will get to that in a moment. Uh, and this looks much simpler here than it actually is, but it can be this simple. This is sort of where I think a lot of confusion starts happening, right? So how does it generate a video? What is the format? How high a bit rate does it have? What kind of color coding does it use? And all of that, has a huge impact on the quality size of that file. In most cases, I just use the default. I don't really care, but there are lots of options in here. And just keep that in mind when you go in that you will have to know, and I have a little slide on this in a moment, but uh, I wanna wait there. We can do audio. As you can see here, we can tell it what sources to use in the mixer by default. Uh, and whatever you have connected to your system will show up. So a uh, real production system, you may have eight microphones and all kinds of other stuff, and it gets quite a complex thing very, very fast. Um, Hotkeys are great to do um, if you do it a lot, so that way you can easily get to things without needing to um, find it in the menu first. Tell it the video format you want, uh, again, your hotkeys, and then the advanced, again, is what the type, what the default format is, the default format of the files, and all that stuff. But none of this impacts the layout. This is just, how does it work when I ask for streaming? And that can mean a little bit. So I don't start here, I start over here on scenes. Um, I'll keep this in. Oh, I don't care. Well, so transform is, so if I click on any object uh, and I'll right click on it, I have a ton of menus here too. So in any graphical system, you usually have a transform that allows you to move things around. So I could say, hey, I wanna move this 80, 90 degrees, right? It's just an image. So it doesn't have to look <laughs> the way that uh, we would prefer to have it, right? So I, all of this stuff is available that you normally would have for an image. Even, you know, you can change the order and that order just basically changes the orders down in the source. Uh, you can give it different names. Uh, even if you have filters in one image that you wanna use somewhere else, you can copy that. Or you can say, hey, I wanna just basically 
format this to the, be the full window right away. So you can click there. Now it takes up the whole side, the whole screen. So there's lots of weird ways uh, or easy ways to to manipulate things to make it faster, better for you. And I must admit, I don't know the details of all of these things because I well I haven't really needed them. But yeah, there's a ton of options showing up in here. Um, so so we also have menus up here that actually replicates what you see down here. This is where you export import scenes. Uh, you can take an existing scene and duplicate it if you just want to make a couple of changes but don't want to mess with the old one. You duplicate it and give it a new name maybe. Um, we can decide what we want to see. Uh, I, I kind of have most stuff turned on, but you don't have to. Uh, here's an interesting thing. If you, When you're rendering, this is very nice to actually see what's coming out of it, how fast is it. Uh, you can look at your stream data uh, as you're going live. So you can have this in a separate uh, monitor and actually see how your stream is doing. And this drop rate, if you see a drop rate go up, um, you have a problem. Either you're not, uh, your bandwidth is too high or your resolution is too high for your equipment to keep up. Uh, we can do multi view, I don't care, and all that stuff is. It's fine. So the last thing I, I want to show in here, um, oh, the output time is actually neat. So you can actually start keeping track of when you do live broadcast of how fast to do it. And you can see, you can actually ask it to automatically start a recording in X number of minutes. So the whole idea is the, once you have set it up, it can be a touch and you know you start it and then you, you do not touch it anymore. Now you, all you're concentrating on is your presentation and your talk. And it automatically determines when to start broadcasting, when to start recording, and when to stop recording, and et cetera, et cetera. All of that can be done. Now, initially, when I started this, I didn't know that, and it would actually kill my recording after 30 minutes. Um, but uh, it's just fun stuff we learn. It has a very robust scripting language, uh, sorry, system, and I think most of this stuff is still Python. So customization, I don't do those, uh, is possible. You can add your own content like so many other things. Uh, so if you need your own special effects and so on that might not be in the system, it can do all of those. Oh, the last thing I need to show. Um, there we go. So this to me is one of those features. As I said, this is the nicest feature I've been missing for so long. So you recognize some of these objects already, right? You recognize my camera. And, you, and uh, this was from a different meeting we call Lux Social. But notice these two other things that are animated that are just counting. And they are the new version, the, the stuff that I've been looking for. So if I click on this timer and I go to properties, it basically asks for a URL. Uh, I actually have a slide on this, so I, I don't want to go into the, the details. So I used a external service to generate this, and this service has some things for free, and that's what I'm showing. But you can actually also pay for additional content. So for a professional YouTuber, for instance, to get access to the number of subscriptions that do you, you subscribe to that service, and they done all the HTML for you. You just basically pull it into your own stuff, and it works. And to me, if you're a YouTuber and you're not an IT guy, I think they, they wanted like $6 a month. That sounds pretty damn cheap. So, but it is just web pages. You can make a local file. Uh, so, if you like programming your own HTML with your own CSS and, and JavaScript, it will work, no problem. But because of that, these web pages here just makes it so darn easy to make any custom content that is act as um, live. And one of the things you can use that for, as I said, is like a subscription count, or it can be a Someone asked a question in the, in the chat, or uh, if you are familiar with YouTube, they have something called Super Chats, where you actually pay money to get your chat highlighted, and that money goes to the content creator. And hence, you can make sound effects and do all stuff, and people do that, and all of that is automatic and all through this interface. And as I said, I've been using OBS for, for years. I have not had this feature. I've seen so many videos and presentations where they use this feature, 
and rave about it, but it has not been in my Linux, in my uh, on the Fedora. You could compile it yourself, but at high risks because it needed stuff that really wasn't there and could crash things very qu quickly. Now it's there and I'm just going, I cannot wait to get better at this. Actually start creating my own uh, HTML and all that stuff and experiment with that. To me, that that's really what the whole game is about. Uh, I can make a lot of automation like this. And then if I automate my transition and, and it means it can be very smooth and still look extremely professional and almost be a one cut broadcast to video and I don't need any edits after the fact. Studio mode, I mentioned very quickly, this is studio mode. As you can see now it's the same thing, but if I go up here and I said click on the command deck, I have this command deck over here if you notice from the video feed from this, it's still showing the one with the animations in it. But I can go up here and I can change whatever, let's say, my Luma, and I can then transit, trans, do a transition from one scene to another. And notice what it did, it now switched them back. So now the, the one that was live before is no longer in, in the live image. And you can go back and forth, and you can, you know, you set your transition timing, all that stuff. And you can see you can actually add your own links up here. So you, you know, if you you can get a full arsenal of the kind of transitions that you like, you can modify the transitions you want or duplicate them out. And as I said, you have them down here. But if I go down in this one and go into it, as you see, these are actually full of options. So in this case, I can use a video file to actually control how the transition is done. There's just so many options, and I don't use most of them. So it, you know, my suggestion is to just experiment. If you don't like the default ones, I'm sure there's something else in there that you that you can use. I'll delete that later. So that was the studio mode. Um, let me go back to, there we go, I don't know, that looks bad. The settings, okay, so we, we basically have streaming and recording left. Let me go back to the slides first and then see if I can finish up that side of it. Okay. So I mentioned this already, and I'm not going to repeat it. Now, I I put two links in here. Uh, these are great sources for these web page objects. They both have free and non-free stuff on them. As I said, I don't think that's a bad idea, particularly if you are just a graphical person that may not be that computer savvy. This makes it very easy for everyone to use it. Um, so going on here, ordering your own, and get, basically just plug in the link in, in our OBS is all that is needed. It, to me, that's a, a nice, simple solution. There you go. So um, you saw this image very, very briefly. There are more than uh, 50 streaming platforms. Again, I'm going to show you that in a moment where to, to do this. But basically, all you need is in most cases are uh, two basic features and underneath that you may get another set of options, right? You need to say, where do I need to send it to? And once you pick a service, there may just be one area you can, there may be a drop down of five or six different options. And that could just be either they may have a premium option where you can stream higher quality or a different format depending on, uh, for, for the streaming option, depending on your software. And you just pick the one that I always pick just the default one. I never really needed to, to do a lot of customization there. And then you go to your streaming platform, and then you generate a key for your stream, and you plug that in, and you're done. Now, you're done in the sense that you have your connection. You will notice down here, it actually tells you that in this case, because I picked YouTube, here are the, the maximum options that I have for my stream. Here's the maximum bit rate. And here's the maximum um, audio rate for, uh, for, sorry, bit rate for both audio and video. And that's what they support. Now, that does not mean you want to be there. 
Uh, it means very high bandwidth when you start doing that, but it also means very clear audio. So, for instance, if you are a musician and you want to show people or have people actually listen to you playing music or teaching them, you may actually need a high bit rate for, for at least the audio to be sure that you actually get it through without too much compression. But, you know, the penalty again is the more you send over the wire, the bigger the file and the longer time does it take to render. So bit rates. I stole this from something called SteamShock because uh, this may be one of those areas that I'm not really sure that there's a hundred percent truth in it, but I like this setting. Uh, sorry, this sort of summary of understanding when you set the bit rate, what resolution does it usually relate to? So. By default, the bit rate is around 2,500, I think, is the default one when you start up. And as you can see, that's barely 720p. That's actually not bad for a uh, for a video conferencing. That's more than plenty. Right, a little video down in the corner where you talk once in a while, you don't need a lot of resolution. But, and you can even do it shorter, and these, again, much more files. Uh, and, and so see how they relate. So when you ask for bit rate, just remember, here's a relationship between them. In most cases, uh, the audio rate seems to be 128, unless you go low quality is 96. Um, I've had lower than that, and for voice, that seems to be okay, but it's experiment, figure out what works for you. But I mean, I like the idea here is to just give you an idea of, well, 6,000 kilobits per second is a lot of traffic on your, if your, if your network can handle it, your ISP can handle it, allows you to do a standard high resolution. This is not 4K. So imagine what this needs to be if you go to 4K. I'm just letting you know that from, from this perspective, higher quality and speed and capacity are really high, highly related. All the tools that I use, you always saw me open up the GIMP. And, well, the GIMP to me is the, the default editing tool for images. It's been forever. I'm not an expert in it by no means, but I can get around. Um, to do these masks, it's, it's relatively easy. Now, GIMP doesn't have a drawing tool. Um, so if you're not used to how to do that, um, it can be a little bit tricky the first time. But it is actually fairly easy to make these transitions. You can even do from, from white to, to black transitions and all kinds of other funny stuff. Um, there are several video editing tools, uh, on, at least on Fedora, that you can choose between. PTV is, is highly uh, advertised. Um, it does work, but I found that um, once you have a large video file, I don't trust it anymore. So, uh, but it is an option. Um, to go in, for instance, just adding a introduction or editing in out a scene, it, it's perfectly fine for that. Um, what I didn't show you installed is the video for Linux. So there's a whole v, V4L loopback uh, module you can install. And what that does is create a kernel module that allows OBS to do the broadcast. So if I go back again, without that module, this vi uh, virtual camera would not show up. But once that module is there, that button shows up. And that basically just allows, in this case, BlueJeans that we are using to see OBS as a camera. So it sees the normal camera and it sees OBS as a camera. And now all I have to do in, a, in, in BlueJeans is to say, what camera source do you want to use? And it thinks it's just any other camera source. And now I can broadcast out what I'm sending. So once that's installed, um, it's easily done. Now, I do want to warn you, uh, I'm a little bit of a purist when it comes to this. It took me forever to actually allow this module on my boxes because it does taint the kernel. And I don't like that because I've had issues before with the kernel crashing doing that. But for now, with a one or two small exceptions, it's been completely painless. So it's, it seems to be okay. So yeah, once you install that VLC, so then that VLC also, by the way, comes with tools to man manipulate your camera in general. So it's a worthwhile <laughs> tool to have if you like to play with video. 
The last couple of things in here is Blender is, I know this is a 3D animation tool and can do 50 million things, but is probably not as well known as it has a humongous, um, complex, advanced, feature rich, however you want to put it, video editing feature built into it. And so together with OBS doing video sources, doing audio mixing, it actually has all the features you will ever need to create a production ready output. It is great for that. And also you can use, if you know how to do graphical animation, now you can add a little bit more twist to your videos when you're done. And of course the last verse is FFmpeg. Um, if you ever need to transition from one video format to another, you know that tool. Uh, it, it may not be the one easiest to remember the command line, but it can translate from any video format to any other video format, audio format. It can spit out audio from video, all kinds of other cool stuff. So when you need to upload, if you don't do it as a stream, it can do it for you. So this is literally the last slide, but I want to show you how to do the live broadcast before we go to these question and answers. So, this is not allowing me to do a profile. Huh. Well, that's weird. Okay, well. Not really sure why it's not showing me a profile up here, but um, I'm not going to really. All profiles it allows you to do, and it just, oh, I think it's because I have a virtual camera going. I can't change it while I'm, I'm doing live, but a profile allows me to set up broadcast settings, streaming settings from multiple different sources. So I, I can easily switch between, let's say I want to do a Twitch stream one day and the next day I want to do a YouTube tw uh, broadcast. I can easily move from one to the other without having to remember all the keys and all the settings and all that. It's just sitting on a profile and switch between them. Um, so in order for me to start a stream, well, first of all, if I click this one, you can see it's actually now saying that it's streaming. Now, it, I have a pre-configured YouTube setup, and I haven't actually tested this yet. As you notice down here in the bottom, it's actually reporting drop frames already. One of the problems I have in this box is that it keeps dropping my um, link rate, as you can see. Oh, it's actually back to 1,000 here. Weird. Now it's actually debugging my network. I will never figure this one out. Um, drop frames are not what you like, as you can see here. I have way too many, which means my broadcast settings are on a way too higher quality from what my network is allowing me to do. And you might be in the same situation I am. I have a fairly high download rate, but a lousy upload rate. And my upload rate is less than six megabits per second. And doing live broadcasts like this, because I'm already streaming on another machine on the same network, it's already eating up all my bandwidth. I'll stop the streaming again. But as you saw earlier, if I go into settings, my stream settings are here, right? So if I go up here, hit show all, here are all the streaming settings, the streaming destinations I can pick. And, from, and stuff. A lot of these I don't know about. I mean, everyone probably heard of Facebook Live, but, but I've never heard of Good Games. I guess it's a Russian site. Um, iLive, um, Nude, OnlyFans, uh, Dora in, in Korea, okay. Uh, but anyway, as you can see, there's so many sources, and you can add your own. There is a custom where you can put in all the the information about what is the streaming format it expects and all that. So even if it's not in the list, you can add that on your own. But if I pick something like Twitch, uh, Twitch, notice how little I have to know. Again, I pick the server. In this case here, I would probably pick one that is closer to me. So I could actually, I guess, pick Aspirin. And I put in my stream key. I'm not going to hit show because it's going to show me an active key, and I'm not going to do that. In a lot of cases, 
that allow you to basically click here and it will take you to the site and generate it. So this is one way of doing it. So let me actually go back to my YouTube and see what happens. Actually, no, let me start on Twitch because I actually have a Twitch thing. I'll zoom this in. Uh, okay. That may not happen because it takes them forever to do. Um, so I'll go back to my YouTube in a second. No, oh, there it is. Wow. Look at that. That was quick. Okay. So as you can see, when I'm in here, again, I won't hit the show, uh, but I need I can just say copy my stream key. I go in here and I put my stream key back in here. I hit apply. That's it. Now, if I hit start streaming, I don't know if it's going to have any drop rates like it did on uh, YouTube. But in this case here, I don't have any drop rates. Um, so who knows? Maybe I'm actually sending out. Okay, now the drop rates are showing up. So again, there's a bandwidth issue here. But that's it. That's what I need to do. Now there are settings that I haven't we, we haven't looked at, right? So if I go on the stream again, I can it, it will by default pick certain things, but if I go under here, I need to tell it what bit rates to choose when I do things. And if I don't set these correct, I will have too much bandwidth. But that's again, it depends on your equipment, it depends on what you're doing. Um, for that to be right. But that's about it. Um, and the recording is a pretty much the same thing. It just uh, starts a recording locally on your hard drive. My recommendation is if you are doing something you need to record as you're doing a live stream, do both. Now you are going to use a lot of disk space when you do it. That said, you know that you're actually recording what you're sending out and not whatever um, the system receives on the audience. So if there is a little bit of, let's say, choppiness on the sound or on the video, that won't show up in your recording. But it will show up on the live recording on the, on the, uh, that, that receives it from the network where all that choppiness happens. So by having that, you have a backup plan so you can re-upload the actual perfect file after the fact. So people who are re uh, viewing the recording afterwards will get a perfect image. Again, but that's about it. So let me actually go back, and I, that should have been the last. Um, yep, that is it. So that's it. So I uh, was trying to not make this too long uh, because we really need to talk about speakers coming up. <laughs> but uh, you guys have been very, very quiet, um, not asked any questions. So hopefully, you might have questions now. Yeah, I think you have one question in the chat, Peter, right from when you um, first yep. started. It uh, came from Arv, and he says, sorry, but what do you run on top of Fedora? And was it was that CUDA? Yeah, I'm using the X11 uh, CUDA driver. Okay. Uh, so it is basically the NVIDIA driver from uh, Fedora, and then I just add the CUDA on top of it, and the moment that happens, then software that supports it can now do graphical processing. Okay. Awesome. And then uh, Brian asked, is Pro Video now 8K? I've heard, yeah, it 8K exists. Uh, but one of the things that I heard is that human eye can't really distinguish 8K and 4K. So at some point, I don't know, except for video analysis, I'm not really sure 8K really makes sense from, from a video, I mean, from a human perspective that we want to show. I mean, even 4K is in Mongers, but 8K, yeah, it does exist. Um, I don't think I will ever use it on my equipment. That's too high. I mean, even 4K is too high. 
And I guess if you want to test that theory about the human eye distinguishing between 4K and 8K, they do have an 8K TV at Best Buy. <laughs> so, just uh, saying. Yeah, but most of the sources you're getting uh, playing back is not 8K. <laughs> That's true. So, it was like when the HD TVs came out first. Very few uh, programs actually broadcast or send it out in HD. It was just upscaled. Anyway. Yep. I know some of the streaming services are saying that they can stream some of their programs in 4K. Um, even Fios, when I still had it, was beginning to roll out some channels in 4K. But you have to have a really um, fast connection in yep. your house yep. to, to, to do enough bandwidth for that. Yep. Absolutely. And bandwidth is the problem in general. So, yeah, let's go back to where we started before my talk. Uh, let me hit the uh, stop recording first and thank everyone uh, for, for attention. And it looks like we actually had quite a crowd today. I'm very happy. Recording. Yep.